<laughs> that being said, I am so thrilled to be here this evening with you to explore this concept of resilience together. So I'm sure that you have seen the headlines. Child bought and sold as sex slave. Caretakers forced children 8 and 13 into commercial sexual exploitation. National FBI sweep rescues 105 sex trafficked children. It is the real lives behind headlines such as this that have led me to spend the last 17 years of my life serving runaway homeless youth and those subjugated to sex trafficking in a variety of capacities, um, from a street outreach mental health professional to a community action organizer. During my master as well as my doctoral degrees, because of the, the things that I saw on the streets, because of my direct practice experiences, um, I recognized this need to develop an assessment tool. Um, and so I explored questions such as, what puts certain youth more at risk for sex trafficking? And of those who were able to survive sex trafficking, what helped them to be resilient? What helped them survive? What helped them to be malleable? And even more importantly, I sought to find the answers as to what would, what would help them become even more strong and able to prosper, pioneering their own personal as well as professional lives. So I will save many of the answers I have found from my research for another day. And so hopefully we will be together again at some point. Rather today, um, I realized that I needed to share some of the backstory behind my work. So I decided, as Dr. Brene Brown would say, I would be a Ted vulnerability role model, right? <laughs> you see, because though I stand before you today, seemingly well put together, perhaps self-actualized or coming from a privileged background. My life has not always been this way. You see, I was conceived and I was born and bred in trauma. I was born in Newport News, Virginia to a mother and a father who together created a home that was fraught with drug and alcohol abuse, domestic violence, and other forms of physical and sexual violence. The memories of this turmoil uh, are not difficult to assume. On February 15, 1994, it was an abnormally beautiful day um, in light of typical February days in, in Kansas. And I got off my school bus and I walked the long walk home. And although, although I lived in one of the most crime-ridden neighborhoods in our city, the familiar sights and sounds and smells comforted me because that was home. Like usual, I went around to the back door of my childhood home and I knocked on a piece of wood that sufficed as a, as a, a window. It had been broken out by neighborhood boys as they were fighting. Usually my mother would come to the back door and, and she would greet me with a hug and I'd be able to smell the meal that she had been making that day. But strangely on this day, she did not answer the back door. And so I went around to the front door and I knocked again, but still there was no answer. And so as I rarely had to do, I dug into my book bag and I looked for that rainbow-colored braided piece of yarn that tied around the throat of my single key to home served as a keychain. I pulled it out, I put it in the lock, and I turned my wrist. And with the click of the lock that I can still hear today, the front door to my childhood home opened. And I looked through the living room straight into the dining room, and there lying on the dining room floor was my mother. Her right hand open, next to it, 
was a gun. My mother had committed suicide. And in an instant, my world, my life as I knew it, changed. I was immediately thrown into a whole new world, a home with different sights and, and sounds and rules. I was thrown into a world of foster care and shelters and group homes. And acting from a place of desperation, and in an attempt to save myself from this confusing sense of displacement that I was feeling, I began running away. And I'm not sure, maybe some of you have, have run away or lived on the streets before, but when you're on the streets, you do things that you typically don't do. Perhaps you steal some food, as Alexander spoke of. But I began doing whatever I had to do to cope and survive, sleeping wherever I could find a place to stay. In general, it seemed my, my life was on a path to nowhere. But one particular evening when I was staying in a certain girls' group home, I had a Popeye moment. And for those of you who don't know, Popeye is an old cartoon character, and other than William Wilberforce, one of my greatest heroes. And as Popeye would say, I had one of those moments where I had all I can stand, I can't stand no more. <laughs> And so, although it was raining outside, I gathered up all of my belongings that I had from this girls' group home, which wasn't for a lot, and I threw it outside of my bedroom window, and I jumped out into the dark evening, raining, pour, rain pouring down, and I ran into the unknown. I didn't have an exact plan of what I was going to do with my life, but that evening I knew there had to be an exact plan for me in this life. Thankfully, the traumatic situations that I faced on the streets, the situations that could have destroyed me, actually led me to where I am today. While on that run, I began researching my legal rights, including that of emancipation, and I also earned my high school equivalency degree, um, which is called a GED in the United States. And after several months, I turned myself back into the same children's home that I had initially run from, and a few weeks after that, um, I presented my case in, in front of my juvenile court judge. She had a very frightening reputation to make social workers cry. But surprisingly, after telling my social worker to shut up and sit down, <laughs> I was trembling, and she said, Karen, I'm proud of you. You're free to go. And so at 16, I was made legally 18, and I was out on my own. But although I was free of shelters and rules, I was not free from myself. The truth is that the emancipation process had really just begun. Soon after I began working for um, a local not-for-profit organization as a street outreach worker, and then I began attending national conferences and serving on regional as well as national board of directors for different child-serving agencies. And like a domino effect, I then had the opportunity to work for a longitudinal study tracking runaway and homeless youth to see how they were progressing into adulthood. And this experience really changed my life because it's ultimately what led me to the work that I do now with sex trafficking survivors. Specifically, I had an experience with a young lady that I will call Tamika. I had gone to pick Tamika up um, for an interview one, one day, and. Uh, she lived in a motel in a really crime-ridden neighborhood in the city in which I live. And I was, I was waiting for her in my car. I noticed that her and her um, pimp, or rather trafficker, began to fight. And I watched this, es this situation escalate, and it felt as though I was in quicksand. Things seemed to go in slow motion, and yet things were occurring rapidly. I knew I needed to do something fast, and so I reached into my purse in the back seat of my car to pull out my cell phone. But before I knew it, he had ripped off her shirt, protruding her five months of maternity. And he, next thing I know, she was in my car, and he was on top of her, hitting both of us, scratching both of us, cussing at both of us. And after what seemed like an eternity, finally an off-duty officer came. And he pulled off this trafficker and cuffed him and put him in the police car. And then he explained to Tamika and I that unless she testified, 
This man would be released within the next 24 hours due to the lack of the legislation at the time. And so I looked at Tamika and I said, Tamika, what will you do? Will you testify? And she said, no, Karen, you don't understand. You see, this is the most, I, most choice I've ever had in terms of who I have sex with. Because my dad had sex with me, my dad let my brothers have sex with me. And my dad invited his friends and my uncles over to have sex with me so that he could purchase his drugs and his alcohol. And I realized at this moment that really, Tamika had been commodified from the day she was born because what can be stolen can be sold. And she had really been prepared to be trafficked all her life. I have not arrived. I am imperfect and I am faltered. But I have come from obtaining a GED to earning a PhD. I have come from a place of utter disconnectedness to receiving a wholeness and finding a life purpose. And I feel as though I've come full circle as I'm able to connect as well as utilize my personal life experiences along with my practice experiences and my academic training in order to work on issues such as human trafficking, trauma, resiliency. Working alongside some of the most amazing survivors as well as professionals, some of the results of this are that in 2005, I founded the Anti-Sexual Exploitation Roundtable for Community Action. A, an action team in order to fight, in the name of fighting human trafficking, brings together um, multidisciplinary professionals, nurses, law enforcement officers, attorneys, in order to, again, fight human trafficking. I'm also the founder and executive director of the Wichita State University Center for Combating Human Trafficking. A center that, in order to prevent and more effectively intervene in the lives of those who are sex trafficked, works to bridge the gap between direct practice, policy, and research by facilitating education, training, research, and advocacy. We are particularly proud of our most recent work and the role that we played in creating new Kansas legislation um, in regards to the anti-human anti trafficking. Specifically, we changed language so that we recognize survivors of human trafficking for what they really are victims rather than criminals. And we also changed laws so that we increase fines and penalties of perpetrators, creating a pool of money so that we can train professionals on how to work with these victims, as well as so that we can provide shelter for the survivors. Perhaps even most importantly, a result of this coming full circle is that I'm able to have a family. I have the best husband in the world, I have a gentle spirited son, and I have a strong willed one year old baby girl. So, what factors allow for this different reality? I could have very easily just been another headline. I believe it's pretty simple hope, passion, drivenness, education, and connections. Even during my most difficult moments, I had hope, I had faith that things could be different and that I had a purpose on this earth. I believe that if you have hope, you can not only find, but you can also maintain passion. Passion was born in me the day I met Tamika. I was deeply saddened by what I saw occurring in her life, but I also knew that things could be different for her. As an abolitionist, I know that William Wilberforce had great faith, but he also had passion about working towards a world where all people could live their life of purpose. Whole, resilient, and prospering. For me, my passion, my passion fed an urgent drivenness. And I have to admit that much of this drivenness came from fear. A lot of people believe that fear is a bad thing, but I think fear can be wonderful if it causes you to act. And drivenness for me, it came from a, an internal voice that said, I never want to recreate the kind of life that I was born into, that I came from. This drivenness was also helpful as I pursued my education. Education is such a great privilege. Even the fact that we're sitting here this evening, 
We are privileged. And for me, education created an environment, as well as the time, to explore and develop my skills, my gifts, my tools, so that I could best implement my passions. Lastly, one of the factors that I believe helps me to be what some people may call resilient is connections. I believe one of the biggest killer diseases is the lack of connection. It is one that fuels many of the many risk factors, including that of human trafficking, because I believe that it is oftentimes safety nets that separates those who live on the streets from those who are able to obtain and maintain a job, a car, housing. And so I'm blessed to be uh, surrounded by a community full of connections, people who have stepped up, changed their paradigms, from teachers to business owners, people who have believed in me and offered me a village of support. I have people in my life who are really committed to the struggle, people who will tell me the truth and love, and then there are also those quiet earthly angels and sideline supporters. And all of them have made the difference in my life. And all of these factors assi assisted in moving me from a state of discontinuity to a state of continuity. You see, because <coughs> these factors created a context in which my maladaptive cognitive generalizations or my negative self schemas based on the trauma and chaos in my life could be challenged and then ultimately changed. These factors are not the detailed codes of my research with sex trafficking survivors. But they are the broad result of resilience. And this broad result of resilience is the same. Those of us who have been redeemed against all odds did not do it by mere grit. But rather, these factors created options, possibility, my story is not abnormally unique. This is really our story, our story of resilience. Yes, I closely know what it means to live life out of desperation. But I also know that it is possible to overcome any life challenge or obstacle. I wholeheartedly believe that all people obtain the capacity for resilience to live a rich and purposeful life. But I also believe that all of us play a role in creating the context in which resilience and prosperity can occur. So all the way from the US, I brought a lovely picture of my daughter, Isabella. And within just a few hours of giving birth to my, my daughter, I began to cry and mourn for all the children, all the young men and women that I have worked with over the years. She's wearing these pajamas, Daddy loves me. All of us deserve to start out life this way. Planned and wanted. Gestated in love and desire. Not exposed to harmful chemicals in the womb. Delivered naturally and nursed. But unfortunately, this is not the case for so many in our world. And so I ask you, what role can you play in increasing the likelihood that it is so? How can you play a role in ensuring that our children, youth, men and women around our world are less at risk of horrendous acts of abuse, homelessness, trafficking, jail sentences, death. Even more so, what role can you play in creating a context that empowers resilience, allowing all people to live their life of purpose, no matter what obstacles they face, against all odds? Let's take care of each other. Thank you.